This morning, we are going to be taking you on a little journey uh, over to the amazing country of South Africa and the archipelago island nation of the Seychelles. Um, and uh, so if you, again, once again, if you have not joined us on our webinar before, you can ask questions by scrolling to the bottom of the screen and clicking on the chat button. Uh, and that is where um, you can pose any questions and then uh, Paul and I will, will do a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, just let me take a brief moment for our members who are new to Wheel and Anchor. What we are all about is bringing travelers together. And what does that mean? Well, I've been uh, bringing Canadians to destinations all over the world for the better part of 30 years. Um, I uh, even wrote a book about hospitality in Austria, uh, and uh, it's a passion of mine to travel with like-minded people uh, and, uh, you know, experience all the amazing things around the world. And that's what makes us a little bit different, uh, is the fact that we, uh, we, we all have a bit of a, a view of travel that is not so fast paced, it's a little bit slowed down, time for fun, time for a glass of wine, uh, and to really uh, you know, enjoy the experience together. My personal goal for every single one of our members is to be well-traveled and well-connected. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, and I mentioned it on a previous webinar. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my parents traveled all over the world, and uh, they would have friends who were also travelers. And, you know, they would come back and share stories from all these great experiences that they had, you know, in Asia and in South America and Africa and all over. And it just occurred to me that these people were some people that I really looked up to. To and I really thought were worldly. And that's what I mean by being well-traveled is, is having had the experience that you can share with friends and family and your grandkids um, about what, you know, what the world is all about and all these amazing experiences. And along the way, of course, we become connected to some amazing people. One of them is Jackie, my good friend in South Africa, I'll introduce in just a second. Um, and, and really, this is what the experience of travel is all about. Joining me on our webinar today, well, I'm Gordon. I think most of you know me. There's a few new names. So uh, I'm the founder of Wheel and Anchor. Um, normally, our colleague Joel is on the, is on the webinar today, but he's, uh, he's left it all to me. So, uh, but uh, of course, Paula uh, in the window right below me. Uh, who is our senior trip specialist. And I know that a lot of you have spoken with Paula on the phone. Uh, so uh, she's joining me and our special guest today, uh, Jackie Goodwin in the bottom window um, is our partner in South Africa. She does all the local coordination of our trips down there. And we were blessed to have her as uh, our local guide and host of our trip. Um, just before we started Wheel and Anchor, we did a trip to Africa uh, and uh, Jackie was our person on the ground. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much for being part of our webinar once again. Uh, it's great to have you all the way from Cape Town. Thanks, Gordon. Good to be here. And just because I know I'm probably a burning question in some minds of our members, what's going on in Cape Town now? Maybe give us a quick synopsis because, of course, we read about riots in uh, parts of the country. We read about COVID-19. I think things have settled down significantly but maybe give us a short synopsis because I'm sure people are curious what's actually happening in Cape Town. Well, you know, they always say ne don't, never believe everything that you read. Um, <laughs> and of course, uh, of course, that applies here too. Uh, us here in Cape Town, those were all up in, so um, they were very localized. Um, fortunately um and and they have also been um quelled i think that's that, that a lot of that drama is done now um so cape town is beautiful cape town continues to be beautiful uh we don't have many visitors here right now um which is a shame because um they're missing out on so much beauty but it's more for us to enjoy and those who do brave the long haul mask clad flights um <laughs> <laughs> have pretty much have Cape Town to themselves. Um, yeah. So, and and of course we're all, you know, everyone in the tourism industry is desperate to delight visitors. Uh, so, so they get literally the best of everything right now. But uh, yeah, but well, yeah, we 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 aren't coming unfortunately till the end of next year. We hope by things the world by then the world will be a little bit more normal and uh, we'll be able to enjoy uh, South Africa in all its splendor and. Um, hopefully by then without having to wear masks everywhere. 
but we'll see, we, right? None of us really know what uh, what's in store for us for the future, but uh, we're staying optimistic at Wheel and & Anchor, and I'm sure you are in South Africa. Um, so our plan today is obviously to bring you, all of our members who are interested in um, experiencing a safari, and not just a safari. We call the program Safari by Land and Sea, um, which it is, but there's so much more to it than that, and we'll talk about that in a second. And I am going to take you on this little um, virtual online journey today as we look at these two amazing countries of South Africa uh, and the Seychelles. So we'll start off uh, here with uh, with the map of where we're going. Just it always helps to get a little bit oriented. Um, I think everybody knows where South Africa is, obviously at the southern part of uh, the continent. Uh, and we'll be visiting primarily the area between Cape Town and over to the east, uh, the Garden Route uh, and Quanway, the private game reserve that Jackie has uh, has booked for us, the whole place. Uh, and uh, before continuing up, flying up to Johannesburg, which is our gateway up to the Seychelles, which if you look on the little inset map, is a small little group of islands up to the north of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so that is our program, and we will... Um, We'll give you the 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 uh, day by day um, uh, itinerary and uh, what you can expect to see along the way. So we will fly into Cape Town, and I'll just make a quick note about uh, about that. Um, uh, there there used to be a routing uh, direct from uh, the U.S. to uh, South Africa, but in the in the meantime, South African Airlines has. Um, had their challenges, so that isn't currently available. At, and honestly, I think the best way to get to South Africa from Canada is to fly to Europe, um, do a layover, even an overnight in some cases, uh, and then the next day fly from there down to South Africa. It just breaks up the journey a little bit, um, and uh, you have a, a great selection of routings to go. But um, in any event, we'll arrive into Cape Town, and you will immediately, already when your plane is flying in, and you'll probably catch a glimpse uh, this is like a bird's eye view of, of the city with Table Mountain in the background. Um, it is as beautiful from the ground as it is from the air. Uh, and uh, once we get in, um, we will um, um, we'll be greeted by Jackie. And what, Jackie, do visitors sort of, what's their first impression? What do they get excited by when they arrive into Cape Town? Well, of course, that picture that you see there is, is, is one of the one of the first things that you see when you fly into Cape Town, um, and that's Table Mountain. Um, the city the city itself is is quite small. I mean, downtown Cape Town is quite small. That's pretty much what you see there. But the city itself is is the the Greater Cape Town area is sprawling. We're a city mm. of about about four and a half million people. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I think two things um, that that strike people that they wouldn't associate with Africa, and that's the mountains, the the large mountain ranges of mountains coming into Cape Town, and then when they arrive in Cape Town, you know, the mountains surrounded by the sea, um, and that's and that that I think is what gives Cape Town its its first sort of wow. It's unique glimpse and character. And then, I mean, I, my, my impression is you get into downtown and, you know, you see tall buildings like, you know, maybe not skyscrapers like we have in North America, but it, it has a very, you know, um, Western European or North American feel to it. Um, and yet the backdrop is, is like no other place. And so um, we'll have time to relax, go and grab a bite to dinner, our usual uh, welcome dinner. There'll be some weary eyes there for sure on our first night. Um, but uh, we will um, we'll, um, carry right on. And we've got four nights booked in Cape Town because I think it's worth it. There's so many things to say. When you, when you get there, uh, I once spent um, three weeks in Cape Town um, some years ago, and, and uh, I, I, I swear I could just spend three months there. There's just so many amazing things to see and do. But I think with four nights and three full days, um, we will certainly um, get to see Cape Town and the environs. Um, the cable car ride up to Table Mountain. What are some of the other highlights that that we can expect to see um, around uh, around Cape Town? And uh, the the Crystal Brand one was was particularly interesting. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, Cristo, you know, Cristo has actually become a, a good friend of ours. Um, just such a warm, sweet man. Uh, so Cristo was the um, the personal. I guess personal um, warder of Nelson Mandela. So, um, as a as pretty much a man in his early twenties, he was um, it was his job to look after 
Nelson Mandela and similar prisoners on Robben Island. Um, and he spent most of Nelson Mandela's prison term with him, both on and off the island. So that was 27 years. And, um, and a, a very close friendship grew between the two of them. Um, and Christo brings um, some insight into Nelson Mandela, the man, and into his experience on Robben Island that, you know, you don't see or read elsewhere. If you've read Nelson Mandela's book, it's, it's packed with facts and, and, and um, information um, and political, you know, political information, but, but you don't get much of the, the, the sort of the humanity um, of, of Nelson Mandela and and Christo, um, he's a, he's a simple man. So he doesn't have much education. Um, as say, he was a prison guard from the, his early twenties. Um, but he's he really brings across the humanity of the prisoners um, and of Nelson Mandela in particular. And um, and during a time when many South Africans believed that Nelson Mandela was a terrorist and and a bad person. Um, Christo mm -hmm. Grunt was was sort of torn between that. You know, he's he's employed by the apartheid government, and he, and the government tells him that he's looking after these, he's watching these these dangerous terrorists, and yet the people in front of him are humans, and and you know they're warm, intelligent, passionate humans who are just wanting the best for their people, um, and. It's and, and to, to talk to Christo and to hear his story really is, I, I think, a, a very special um, event in if for anybody who's who visits South Africa. Absolutely. And that's that's exactly the reason why we're so blessed that you have this connection, this friendship with him that enables us to have a meeting with somebody who is connected to, you know, one of humanity's most um, significant characters. So that, you know, in addition to you know, the, the scenic beauty of Cape Town, but also getting this in-depth insight um, and spending some time with Christo will be will be undoubtedly a highlight of our trip. Um, uh, so um, the next day, the next full day that we have, um, we'll head down to the Cape of Good Hope, um, which is not the southernmost tip of Africa, as it's often mistaken to be, um, but it is, uh, it, it is a spectacular drive out of Cape Town along the coast. I never forget this Chapman's Peak Road, um, where you literally want to stop every five minutes to take um, a photograph. Uh, and uh, again, what, 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 is the, what is the highlight of the day there? I know for some people it's the penguins, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's so many highlights on this day. I think just just the peninsula is just is just spectacularly beautiful. Um, you know, and, and I've had a number of people liken it to Big Sur, for example. Um, mm. But it's um, it's the road the the whole of the peninsula is beautiful. The road around the peninsula just you know you've got mountains on the one side and you've got the ocean on the other side everywhere that you go. Um, a number of small towns and um, suburbs along the way that um, all with the with unique character. The penguin colony, which you don't expect to see in suburban South Africa, um, <laughs> and then the Cape of Good Hope, um, which itself is um you know the reserve is is starkly beautiful um so yeah it's just um i really like the day because i live out on the peninsula so it's home to me but um but it's also it i like it because it's it's um it's a happy day i think everybody yeah. who goes out and on the for, to the peninsula just enjoys the day Come, comes back with a big grin and that's that's my um, recollection as well uh, as well um, our last full day in Cape Town will spend um, part of the day at these wonderful gardens but um, I think it's important to point out as well is, is that on so many of our trips um, we, we make sure that we allow time to just stroll around and, and Cape Town is is uh, famous for among other things the V and a waterfront which is this beautiful development um, that uh, of, of malls and restaurants on the, 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 the seashore. Um, and uh, we're located where we're going to be staying is, I guess, right downtown, right? Right close to uh, the VNA waterfront and all the other things. And um, how, I, I, this is a question I'm sure a lot of people have in their minds as well. How safe is it in Cape Town these days? Uh, you know, Cape Town is just like any other big city, um, but uh, certainly the tourist areas um 
are are pretty safe. Um, we've I, I'll, I'll be honest, I've, we've not had any any sort of security issues in the past several years. Um, there there are police out um, if you're walking on the road um, at night, but during the day. Um, you know, this, the city in its, itself is probably the safest of all the cities in South Africa um, by far, and uh, and it's a very pedestrian friendly city. So uh, you'll find a lot of locals walking, um, and and certainly many of the of the foreigners who come to to South Africa will will walk. Um, yeah, people. I find people sort of ask the question. There's a bit of apprehension because you read the stories about it, but my experience as well is you could just walk everywhere and it's just like at home um you know we always say you know be cautious because you should be cautious in any big city but uh uh but otherwise it's great and we'll we'll spend the last day part of the day at these amazing botanical gardens which i've missed on every trip i've made to cape town but i understand they're huge and not only spectacular uh on for for south africa but really for almost the whole world they say they're some of the most beautiful gardens anywhere yeah, so well, I think what's what's unique about Kirstenbosch, it's uh, the gardens, the property itself is about a thousand acres, um, but 90 acres are cultivated. Um, but it's not like um, something like Bouchard Gardens or, or you know, some of the, the beautiful gardens that you, you, you associate with, um, with botanical gardens. What's unique about Kirstenbosch is that it is an entirely indigenous garden so mm. it showcases indigenous plants from throughout southern africa and then and if you think about the the cape floral kingdom the cape area um of the six global floral kingdoms now we're talking about across the world mm. the cape floral kingdom is a discrete kingdom um so it's it's endemic to the cape uh, we've got uh, close to 10,000 different species of plants in the Cape Floral Kingdom, and that's in a very small area. Um, and many of these are represented in Kers at Kirstenbosch. So um, what's nice about sort of October, November is that there's a lot flowering, um, a, lot of, a lot of plants are flowering, and, uh, and the gardens are particularly beautiful at that stage. But, um, but yeah, I mean, they just, it's beautiful just to walk through them, whether, the, whether there's a lot of flowers setting. or not. Table Mountain lo uh, looming above, um, yeah. really amazing. And uh, yeah, it'll be a very special last day. We'll then drive out of uh, Cape Town um, and head into the Winelands area. Um, so we're gonna head, first of all, to the east um, before heading up to Franchuk. And we're gonna, um, again, the, the, the scenery, it's like every day you're gonna be spellbound on this trip, believe me. Um, and uh, like, you know, this is what it looks like driving along the coast. We're gonna head up to Hermanos, which is a lovely little seaside town. I understand we might be lucky and see some whales while we're there as we're passing through. Yeah, so it's, it's towards the end of the whale season, but, um, but we have seen them through into November. So good chance. So good chance we'll cross our fingers. And one of my favorite things about this area, um, you know, we're all a bit familiar, uh, those of us that enjoy wine, uh, the vineyards, um, and in this, in this um, in, not far from, uh, uh, from um, Hermanus is this Hemelin Arde Valley. Um, and I remember the last time, actually, I think I was in Cape Town, um, we drove out there uh, and our, our, as I was discussing with Jackie before, as we were putting this program together, we're, gonna, we're planning to go to the same vineyard not necessarily we'll see we may change our minds but um uh the the one thing i mean south africa has incredible wines uh our liquor stores in canada don't really do them all justice because there's so much more um but the food is outstanding and so we're gonna have a, a winery uh lunch um with like a wine pairing food menu that i i'm I'm telling you now, it'll probably be the best winery lunch you've ever had. And that's a bold statement because I know, you know, in Napa Valley, they do great stuff. Um, but in South Africa, it is top, top notch. Um, it's going to be lovely. So we'll arrive into, into French Hook, into the little village um, itself. And, you know, this, the Cape Winelands is, is surrounded by these incredible mountains. Um, you sort of get a sense of the, of the colors here, the white buildings that are iconic for, for the Cape Winelands area. Um, what, what are the key things? What, are the, what, what makes this area so significant, to, uh, Jackie, that we're gonna take in while we're spending the day in Franchuk? Well, this is, this, this is very much a, um, an agricultural area, but there's, it's packed full of history. Um, so when the Dutch first arrived in the 17th century, 
Um, obviously, Cape Town was the first place that they colonized, but but after Cape Town, this was the one of the first areas that that they moved to, um, and it was it was a purely rural area. Um, it's a great um, a great area for growing wine and deciduous fruits. So that's really what characterizes this area is the, is the, the history, the, the, the rich Dutch history um, and, the, and, and the, the Mediterranean style agriculture. Makes Amazing. it beautiful. Yeah, it's it's stunning. I've been here many times. I could I think I could spend the rest of my life here um, drinking wine in uh, in, in the Cape Winelands. We then will head uh, again back. Uh, we're heading sort of gradually to the east here towards the, the garden route into an area called the Klein Karoo. Now this part of the trip is new to me as well. Uh, and so, so what makes this so special? How does the landscape change? What do we experience as we um, head towards uh, the Swartberg Mountains and, and this Klein Karoo? So yeah, this is this is a really exciting um, part of South Africa. So Karoo is um, a word that's derived from an Aboriginal language, and it means first land. Um, and the Klein Karoo is Klein is small. There's a Klein Karoo and there's a Groot Karoo, um, the the small and the large Karoo. So this is this is the Karoo that's that's closest to the more vegetated and more lush areas but it's it's a valley that sits in the, in the rain shadow between two ranges of mountains um and and of course it's very dry you, you can see although this the, in this in this image there's um farmland which is all irrigated um the mountains behind are, are pretty are pretty dry um and that's really what the whole area looks like um but uh, it, what's exciting about this is that just over the mountains is the garden route, which is very lush. Um, and so it, you have this very stark contrast in um, different uh, landscapes. Um, and then, of course, the farming, the farming and, and the, the um, agricultural and the living of, of people both in the, or in the Karoo versus on the coast. Um, so we're going to the Karoo because this is ostrich country. Um, and this is the, the sort of the, the heart of our um, ostrich industry. Um, exactly. And, and ostriches are a really an important um, livestock, I guess, if you will, because these are all domesticated birds. Is that not correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is ostriches have been farmed since the 1800s, um, first for their feathers. Um, and then, of course, after people, after interestingly, when with the um, advent of the car and people people's hats getting blown off, they stopped needing ostrich feathers. And and of course, this it had built up this huge um, industry in in Otsun. And so um, and the industry crashed. And but people had all these birds and wondering what to do with these birds now. Um, and so these days, uh, ostrich meat and ostrich leather. Is, is really what it's all about. And, and, and this is sort of the heart of the ostrich meat and leather industry in, in, in Africa, really. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is uh, I, I've heard so many stories from this area. And of course, if, uh, if uh, you are vegan, it's probably not the place to, uh, <laughs> but I can tell you if you're not, um, ostrich is one of the delicacies that you'll um, that we'll undoubtedly get to try when we're in uh, that when we're in South Africa. Um, we will um, then head down to the south again, so we're heading back out to the coach to the coast um, from Utshorn, and this is the beginning of the garden route. Uh, and uh, it's here that we are going to pass through a number of towns. We're headed for Storms River, um, but the photo here that you see is, uh, I guess, a little bit of indicative of what. The coastal lifestyle is like uh, in here in the in the western part of the Garden Route. Yeah, so that that uh, is a picture of Neisner, um, which is uh, one of the more sort of one of the larger and better known holiday towns on the Garden Route, which we we and I think we do we will spend some time there. Yeah, we 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 pass through there um, as we make our way uh, uh, through the Garden Route. Tell us a little bit about what's the significance of it, because I know, you know, uh, I, I know people go to South Africa and say, oh, we did a trip along the garden route. Um, it's not like a bunch of gardens. Um, how would you describe the garden route, the experience of it for, for our members? What, what can they expect? Um, so the garden route, uh, it's also known as Eden. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's a beautiful stretch of coastline, um, very rugged, 
um, rugged coastline, uh, very rich waters. It's, in, it's the, the Indian Ocean um, versus the Atlantic Ocean in Cape Town. Um, and um, thick, lush indigenous forests, uh, hardwood forests. So, um, you know, yellowwoods, um, milkwoods, uh, you know, these long, um, long living, slow growing trees um, mm. and, and everything that's associated with them. So it's, it's just very green and lush. Um, it has its own microclimate. So um, it's, you know, it's, there's, there's a fairly high rainfall, mostly summer. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just beautiful. Beautiful, really. beautiful, beautiful <laughs> countryside. I, I, I'm dying to go along this part because uh, I, I have missed out on previous um, visits. Um, we'll be staying uh, down in uh, this um, in village of uh, Tsitsikama. I, did I pronounce that right? Perfect. And uh, so the national park here is, as you say, on the Indian Ocean in the Garden Route. Um, and we go, we go on a little bit of a hike here. Is that right? Yeah, so there is a is a boardwalk hike that, in fact, that's it there. Um, and then this this uh, swing bridge that goes goes across Storms River, um, which is a, a very well known um, river in uh, in in the Eastern Cape. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the hike you can hike as far up that hill on the other side as you want. Otherwise, um, you know, you would just stay on on the boardwalk. Um, but again, it's through the indigenous forests. Um, there's some petrified rock um, at that mouth. So there's um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of exciting stuff to see and do. Yeah, it's it's going to be amazing. And so, you know, here we are, we'll have, we're, we're all already, we'll have been um, um, 10 days into the trip and we'll have seen Cape Town, we'll have seen the Cape Winelands that are so famous, the Cape of Good Hope, and then the Garden Route and the Klein Karoo. And then it's here then that we come to Kwandwe, which is, um, I, I hate to say highlight because everything's a highlight. The whole country is a highlight. But, you know, the program is called Safari by Land and Sea. So we get to the land part. I know everybody's um, anxious to find out what is it all about. We have picked Kwandwe Private Game Reserve um, as the place where we're going to experience some of Africa, South Africa's incredible wildlife. Tell us about the place, the experience. What can we expect to see for our members that have not been on a safari before? How does it all work? And I'll, I'll put on some uh, beautiful pictures of uh, some of the things that we might expect to see in Kwandwe. Okay, so Kwandwe is um, a, a private game reserve versus a national park. Um, so this is all private land. It's uh, about 54,000 acres of reclaimed farmland. Um, so the Eastern Cape was primarily farmland um, since pretty much since colonization. But of course, before colonization, of course, all these animals were there. Um, the owners have um, restocked it with over 7,000 um, animals um, of different species, and that includes obviously the cats. Um, I think two of the biggest sort of successes was the introduction of cheetah. Uh, it's the first time cheetah has been in that area since the late 1800s. Um, and then more recently, black rhino. Now black rhino, we all know is one of the most endangered uh, animals. And, um, and heavily poached, uh, particularly in, in South Africa. Um, and so to be able to introduce successfully and breed successfully um, takes a lot of time, effort, money, um, and a lot of, a lot of security. Um, and so uh, any game reserve that is, going, that is willing to, to spend that um, on black rhinos is, is, is serious about what they're doing. Um, serious, and is, yeah. Yeah, Kwando is very serious about conservation. And, and um, you, you, you made an important point at the beginning, I just because is, you know, a lot of people think about South Africa and Kruger is what immediately comes to mind, a national park. Um, but uh, I know from my own experience of having been to a, a Kruger and as well as a couple of private reserves, um, this is the ultimate safari experience because um, you know, I, I, when I say controlled environment, you know, it, it, this isn't a zoo by any stretch of the imagination, right? There's no fence. <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, I mean, there's it because it's private land. Uh, it, there is there's a big fence around the whole place, but once course, but within right, 50, yeah. you've got fifty four thousand acres of no fencing, no. Um, and uh, I, I think the difference between this and a, and a and a national park is that it, yes, it is controlled because it's managed, but it's only managed in as much as 
you know, you want to make sure that you have the right biomes and you have the right carrying capacity and you've got the right animals. Um, but there's no intervention. Um, the animals are not fed. There's no supplementary feeding. There's no veterinary care. Right. Um, uh, unless, I, I mean, I say that, but but the truth is you're not going to let a black rhino die from a snake bite, no. for example, <laughs> after all that. Um, but um, but but typically, you know, there's, there's not much intervention. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the other part of the private game reserve is, is that the accommodations. Uh, and so here's a wonderful picture over the Fish River Lodge, which is one of the camps, I guess you can call it a camp, um, <laughs> hardly camping, but uh, uh, describe this because, I mean, you know, there's so many great aspects to this particular safari experience. Obviously, the animal, we're there for the animals, we're there for this wide open space of Africa, um, but it doesn't hurt to do it when you're staying in a place like this. What about the lodge? Yeah, well, again, because it's private, um, they can do whatever they want. And so they can make it as luxurious as they want. And this is, and I, I think this is where, this is what has become of the African safari these days, is it's, um, you know, you, you, it, it costs a lot of money to keep um, an, an, a game reserve. And, um, and, you know, you need to be able to charge the, the, the requisite amount for people to be there, but then you need to um, still offer them a level of luxury that they probably would not have elsewhere. Um, and so this is, this is very typical of a private game reserve. This is, this is a, a luxurious lodge. Um, you have everything that you need um, in abundance. Um, so this is one room. Um, so this would, this would serve two people. Um, yeah, pretty much yeah, exactly. everything that and you need there. They've got everything that you need and more. You've got plunge pools there. Um, you obviously have three meals a day. And I think that there's snacks and tea in between. And, oh, yeah. um, and the drinks are all part of the program. I mean, you, you know, this is one of those places where you come and you just think you never ever want to leave ever again. I mean, it, it's... Uh, um, it's 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 stunning in its beauty. The accommodations are comfortable. Um, you know, you can be outdoor with the lions and, and uh, uh, leopards and <laughs> taking a shower. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th th this is the ultimate, and this is part of the why we wanted to do Quandway. Um, and we have some different activities. So you do your typical game drives where you're out in a four by four vehicle, which is in South Africa. The vehicles are open topped. Um, so you're, you know, exposed to, to the wilderness, if you will. Um, we also do a walking safari here at Kwanwe, which is something that's a bit unique. Yeah. So, and again, you know, that's that's one of the big differences between a private reserve and, and a national park where you can't do that um, typically um, without special permission. So uh, we do, we can do bushwalks and then we also do uh, the big game walking safari, um, which is where you will have... Um, a guide who has carries a rifle with them um, and you'll go out and the idea is that you go looking for big game on foot so that would be elephants buffalo if you see lions if you see leopards cheetahs um, the plan is to get as close to them as you can so that you can see them in in the wild um, and uh, obviously it's it's all done safely um, yeah. but um, but yeah that's one of the that's one of the the exciting um, additions uh, that that one can do at a private reserve. Absolutely, one of the exciting things, and um, a highlight as well. Always a bush dinner out at uh, a site like this in the in the middle of the reserve, um, and you know, fabulous South African food and wine and everything. Um, it will be an incredible conclusion um, to our stay in South Africa, and what will un excuse me undoubtedly um, remain fixed in your mind for a long time. But nevertheless, after a few days there, um, we have to wind up the South African portion of our journey. Um, and we will, um, we, we designed the trip so that there's uh, ample time to go from here to our next destination. So we'll have the morning to relax and then we'll fly up to Johannesburg. Um, and the program can be done in two parts. So you can choose to just do uh, South Africa, which will be this two-week trip that covers really some of the best parts of the country. Um, 
and then I um, either continue on with us for the Seychelles portion um, or otherwise flow, uh, fly back. So we'll spend a night in Johannesburg, not far from the airport. And those who um, opt to 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 uh, go back home, um, we can we can certainly set up a tour of the city of Johannesburg, which is fascinating. I mean, Cape Town is a spectacular city. Johannesburg is just a big city, um, but nevertheless, it has its interesting aspects to it. Um, and so anybody that wanted to spend more time, uh, we would certainly set something up for you. Um, and uh, that that will, as I say, wrap up the first part of the trip. And that also wraps up our time with Jackie. Uh, um, and so uh, I will, I, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to share your, um, your South Africa that uh, I know you are so passionate about. And uh, again, I know our members who uh, traveled with us, with me to South Africa some years ago and with you um, had such a fond memory of it. Um, we can't wait to come back, Jackie. Um, we, we had a, we've had a delay because of all this craziness in the world. We'll be back soon. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your braai tonight. Are you <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, thank you for joining us and, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. And we'll, yeah. Thanks, thank you, Gordon. Okay, um, we'll carry on from here. We'll let Jackie uh, uh, head off uh, for dinner and we'll carry on to the next part of our trip, which is the Seychelles. So, uh, and again, I put these two trips together, uh, two in one, um, because, you know, the experience of South Africa is so great. Um, and what a way to cap it off, particularly three days on safari by um, doing a little bit of beach. Um, although this isn't hardly beach, it's far more than that. Uh, but the Seychelles Islands are really one of those exotic places in our minds, um, like Tahiti or Bora Bora or something like that in the South Pacific, um, that very few Canadians go to because, let's face it, it's a long way away. You're not going to fly here for a, um, a beach destination like you would fly to the Caribbean or something like that. And frankly, there's so much more to it than that. So the Seychelles, as you can see from the map here, a group of islands that's to the north, the northeast of uh, Madagascar off the coast of Africa. Um, it actually covers a massive amount of uh, the Indian Ocean. We're focusing on the central group of islands, um, which uh, is the, the principal island of Mahe, which is where we fly into. Um, and we travel by our wonderful mega yacht through around the island. So we'll fly out of Johannesburg uh, that afternoon, arriving in the evening into um, into Mahe, and then we'll head right out on a tender where we'll be meeting our ship just off of this beautiful island you see here on the map. Um, so our arrival will be at night, which will be a wonderful surprise when we wake up in the morning and you'll see this incredible mountainous island of Mahe in front of you and the turquoise blue waters, and you will be absolutely mes mesmerized. So it kind of works out really well that way um, because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, because, because we're arriving in the dark and then we'll just have this um, wake up in the morning and you'll be you'll be truly blown away. Um, let me say a few things about our ship. Um, I sailed on this vessel with um, a, a small group about uh, three, four years ago um, on the Peg Pegasus. She's since been refurbished uh, completely. I mean, she was a she was a very comfortable ship then um, and now um, and now even more so. Uh, it is 147 feet long. Um, it is a double hulled motor yacht. She spends all year round just sailing around the Seychelles. Um, she accommodates only 44 passengers with 18 crew. So there's a great staff to crew um, ratio. The staff on board, the crew on board are super friendly um, and are really there to, to look after you. Uh, and there's, uh, there's just a, a perfect balance of space inside and out. Sometimes we eat meals out on deck. Um, like this, sometimes in the comfort of the air-conditioned dining room. Uh, here you can see a little bit the inside, the bar, the lounge area. Um, super cozy, super comfortable. Um, the cabins range in size between about 130 and 200 square feet. So good size for a um, for a mega yacht of this of this nature. And there's a few different categories of, of cabins available, but all of them in any event are outside cabins with windows like this. So you simply don't miss a beat. So it's, uh, it's a great ship. As I say, I've been on it myself and uh, we, we had a marvelous time. So what are we gonna do in the Seychelles? 
Uh, sorry, my screen just jumped ahead there really quick. Well, we're going to go to a number of different uh, of the islands. And, you know, the Seychelles, if you can picture, like, it's kind of like the Bahamas in that North Americans, you know, they fly down to go and sit on a beach for a week. Um, and the Seychelles is the same thing for, you know, wealthier Europeans, you know, they'll go down, they'll go check into a resort on one beach, and they might do a side trip. Um, and the beauty of this trip is that we really get to experience all of the um, unique aspects of these different islands. So it's unusual. In fact, it was the only ship when I was uh, uh, cruised around the Seychelles, there were no other ships like this. There were no other yachts. There were some sailboats. Um, and so um, this is about the best way, as far as I'm concerned, to um, visit this unique part of the world. We'll start at the island of Curieuse, um, which uh, is famous for its giant tortoises that you see here. And they're not in captivity. They're just simply wandering around. And, you know, the Seychelles being in its lo location in the middle of the Indian Ocean was also where a lot of um, trading happened. Um, and it, what's, what's really interesting, what's really curious on Curieux is uh, there was a, a, a former leper colony there, um, which is not something that you see in very many places, but it's one of the the, the neat kind of um, things that we'll experience as we make these various stops um, along the way. Each place that we stop at, in some cases, our ship can actually moor it appear, but most of the time um, we are uh, we are going in by tender. So um, the, the, the ship's uh, tenders and zodiacs, um, you load in from the side of the, of the boat and then uh, you go in. Um, but some of the islands, like here, for example, Cousin Island and Anselazio, um, they have uh, um, uh, protected habitats on them because you find uh, bird life here. Um, this particular cousin island has 250,000 birds on it. Some of them are endemic to this part of the world. Uh, and so the, the ship's tender is not actually allowed to go on shore because they're completely paranoid. They take um, uh, ecological preservation very, very seriously in the Seychelles. So only a boat from the island can actually come to the ship and we have to get on their boat in order to be able to go to shore because they don't want any risk of any insect or any um, other animal that might jump uh, off ship, so to speak, um, to go in. Uh, each day we'll be stopping in a place like this to visit a beach like Anslazio, which is considered one of the top 10 beaches in the world. Um, uh, incredible snorkeling, bird watching. Um, and so it's a perfect combination between, you know, like a, um, uh, you know, a flora fauna, like a scientific expedition, um, as well as a lot of relaxation. We'll visit uh, Aride and Saint-Pierre, uh, this, this particular island here, the, you can see the granite outcroppings. Um, they're famous for this Wright's gardenia plant, which is once again, one of the many, many endemic species you don't find anywhere else in the afternoon. Um, over in Saint-Pierre, uh, we uh, get to visit a uh, uh, spectacular set of coral reefs um, with some snorkeling or just swimming. Um, so there's a whole bunch of um, activities that we get to enjoy. This is much more than just a beach holiday. This really is, uh, you know, an adventure into a, a, a very, very different ecosystem. Um, we'll visit the island of uh, Praslin, which is the second largest island in the Seychelles archipelago. Um, and here you get to see, you know, some villas and smaller resorts. Uh, and the, the one thing I remember about the Seychelles is, is, is you don't have these massive giant, um, you know, all-inclusive resorts like we see, um, you know, so much of the Caribbean and so on. Um, the place is beautifully uh, preserved. Um, the beaches, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the plant life uh, surrounding the, the mountains and so on is incredible. Um, here on Praslin, um, our special excursion, we have five excursions on this. So almost every day we have an excursion onto an island. Most of them are related to the flora and fauna. Here we go to the Valley du Mai Nature Reserve and they're famous for the Coco de Mer coconut. In fact, it's the, the icon of the Seychelles. Um, and it's a double coconut, which has the largest nut in the plant kingdom in it. So it's really kind of a neat thing to see. Um, and on top of that, these black parrots, another en endemic species in the Seychelles, um, feed off of these nuts. So um, one, of the, one of the unique aspects of, uh, of this part of the trip. Um, we will also visit the wonderful island of Ladi. This is the one that remains uh, firmly planted in my mind uh, because it's, um, it's actually not that small of an island, but most of it, the, there's no cars on it at all. So most people go around by bicycle. Um, they have a few uh, horse-drawn carriages. Um, and so it's like the most idyllic tropical island that you've ever seen. And it's 
Cruise. Now you arrive there and you see the white sand beaches and you know everybody riding around on bicycles and the little shops and markets and you 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 know you, you immediately think you could sort of spend the rest of your life there if you're somebody that likes tropical islands um, like I do since I live on one here in Thailand. But um, the Seychelles is uh, is another another level altogether. We'll head back towards Mahe uh, and on our second last night. Um, we'll stay out here in Moyen Island, which, uh, as the caption says, is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Um, here again, we'll see a different species of tortoises. Um, we'll uh, enjoy some more swimming and snorkeling, a barbecue on the deck. Um, and uh, then we'll have our final captain's dinner that evening. Uh, and uh, they'll bring in some live um, musicians from the Seychellois, from the islands and we'll have a great time um, before we have to um, bid farewell to the Seychelles, or maybe you want to stay on a few extra days. Um, that's what I did uh, the last time I visited there, and uh, my memory of it uh, will remain firmly implanted in my mind for, for a long, long time. So uh, that will wrap up our trip. Um, from the Seychelles, uh, you can um, fly uh, from different routings back to Canada. It's a bit of a long journey, but that's why we, why I always recommend doing a layover somewhere on the way back um, just to break it up a bit. So let me talk a little bit about the logistics. You'll find the details in the brochure, um, which we'll be sending you together with a copy of the replay as we always do. Um, so uh, covering off some of the topics, I'll just go over it quickly because it's all spelled out in detail in the brochure. Um, our pricing for the South Africa portion, 7780 can Canadian dollars. Um, that's per person based on double um, with a relatively modest single uh, occupancy up um, surcharge um, if you'd like your own room. Um, and, uh, you know, that's largely because places like Kwandwe, uh, everything is oriented to two people. So solos do have to pay a bit of a premium. I'm sorry about that. I, I wish it was different, but that's, that's how it goes. For the Seychelles, um, you can see the pricing here with the various decks that we have available. There's only 20 cabins on that ship. We've reserved roughly half of them. Um, and it's a, a fairly popular program since not many, there's not, there's not many other ways to visit Seychelles like this. Um, and so, but we have our, our allocation of space. And again, the details are in there. Our program is in. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to. Uh, the slide isn't progressing. The slide yep. didn't move forward. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, because I have two screens going here. So I apologize. So I'll just go back again quickly and uh, yeah, now it's gone the wrong way. See, this is why I don't have technical expertise on here. Um, so the pricing slide, again, all the information is in the brochure. So you can look at it in uh, greater detail there um, for both the uh, South Africa and the Seychelles portions. Um, I won't go through all the details of the inclusions, but as most of our members know, um, pretty much everything that you need for the trip um, is included in the program. Uh, places like Kwandwe, we actually have three meals a day, full board, drinks, everything. It's uh, it's really like an all-inclusive. Um, the rest of the time, as I mentioned about South Africa before, um, we've left some dinners open because there's so many incredible restaurants to visit and the food. Um, and I, I always say this because I think a lot of people don't realize that about South Africa. It, there's so much, it has so much going for it, but the cuisine is something that if you visited there, you'll know why I, I rave about it. Um, on the Seychelles portion, of course, um, it, uh, uh, you, you, we are looked after for a week on the ship. We have full board. Um, all the excursions are in the program. So as usual, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fully packed. The uh, only things that are ex excluded are airfare, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and any other overnights um, and anything else that, uh, that you might need along the way. But for the most part, uh, uh, the program is all inclusive. And this is a great picture, by the way, uh, on the right side of the screen of uh, the Cape of Good Hope um, and uh, Cape, Cape Point, as they call it, with the lighthouse. Uh, this is uh, truly a spectacular scene. Um, getting to South Africa and the Seychelles, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, there is no more direct flight between North America and South Africa, at least at this point in time. Um, but there are great connections via the major European gateways like Frankfurt, Amsterdam, and London uh, that you can get from any of the cities in Canada and then connect um, either with a layover or, um, uh, or with a shorter stay to get down to Johannesburg. And if you're coming back from the Seychelles, um, the same thing, there are some connections 
um, via like Dubai or Istanbul or um, a number of other places. So although it's a bit of a journey um, and that's why it's worth it to go, I think down here for a longer period of time. Uh, so we are now into the questions part. And so I will defer to Paula to uh, let me know. Sorry, here's the question screen. Yes. So Paula, some members, some questions from our members. We have a few here that I'll read out to you. So um, I believe you've already touched on it, but um, a couple people have asked if we can do the Seychelles without the South Africa part. Absolutely. Yeah. So the programs are mutually exclusive. So you can do just South Africa, or if you've been to South Africa or whatever, you can do just the Seychelles. Um, uh, so absolutely. That's why we price them separately. Um, you're welcome to do either or. Um, it is a long way to go to just to go to the Seychelles. So, you know, I would suggest that, um, that perhaps joining us or, or, or going off to, to somewhere else, if you're in that area, um, you could go to Mauritius, you could go to Réunion. There are other, uh, you know, places in Africa that you could visit. But of course, that's entirely up to you. Um, when I visited, I actually did have friends that flew all the way from Canada just for a week in the Seychelles, and they didn't regret it. So... <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, another really good question here. Eric is asking about vaccination requirements. Yeah, so vaccination requirements, I mean, South Africa at the moment um, and the Seychelles, uh, the Seychelles, by the way, uh, uh, really got a good handle on. I mean, it's, it's, it's relatively easy when it's a small country like that. So, so they're quite, um, uh, they've managed the COVID situation quite well. Um, they will require vaccinations. Um, and it is anticipated, although not, uh, to my knowledge, not set in stone yet, it's pretty sure that South Africa um, will, and uh, of course, Wheel and Anchor, we, we've decided to require our uh, members to have vaccinations as well, just out of an abundance of caution and of respect for all of our other members. So um, uh, yeah, hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, I think it's also important to note um, for South Africa, it's always been mandatory to have your yellow fever vaccine for entry. Exactly. And it's a very smooth process. I remember from when I had uh, entered and had to show proof with my vaccination yeah, card. That so. little yellow book from the World Health Organization. That's exactly right. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, Eric had another question here. He didn't see the pricing for this second part of the trip. Eric, yeah, I can sorry, send I it. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll send it to you, Eric. Um, and anybody else that's interested, you can give me a call or an email um, after the presentation. So that's Good. Let me just see another question here we have from Beitol is, what is the weather like in South Africa in October, November? Uh, so, the, so the weather in October, so we're going basically from spring into summer in October. Uh, so the weather typically in Cape Town and the garden route, garden route is usually in the low to the mid 20s. So it's really perfect touring weather and as good safari weather as well. We will may get a few drops of rain here and there as is typical in, in sort of spring anywhere. Uh, but uh, it's really quite pleasant. Excuse me, in the Seychelles, um, it's tropical and the weather there is pretty much the same all year round. It's around 30 degrees plus or minus during the day and at night it drops down to 24, 25. Um, it, so uh, yeah, it, it doesn't perfect. change much. It sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect as we're going through a heat wave here in Ontario right now. It's a bit unbearable. <laughs> so um, another question here from Betul was if the uh, pricing of 7, 780 included the Seychelles and is it all in Canadian dollars? So yes, it's all in Canadian dollars. Um, and the two segments are priced separately. So we have one for the, the two weeks in, the, in South Africa, and then we have a separate price for the uh, week in, in, in the state gel. So they, yeah, they're completely separate. So if you want to do both, you just add them together. Perfect. And Beto, I'll be sure we'll be sending out the magazine to everybody who's registered. So they'll, you'll get a chance to look at that, even though we went through this, those far slides a little fast today. Um, another question here from Tracy is how rough are the seas around the Seychelles? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, you know, we do cross when we go from Mahe to Praslin and up to the smaller archipelago, we do cross some fairly open water. Um, but the, the, that part of the Indian Ocean is, is not generally uh, very rough. 
Um, I mean, you can get some big ocean swells that sort of pass through. So I would say that, you know, it's, it's, there's a chance that you'll get some gentle rocking of the ship. It's not going to be perfectly still. Um, no ship it ever is, uh, is quite frankly, but uh, it was, uh, let's put it this way, it was, a, it was a, for me, from my experience, a lot less motion than even being on a cruise ship in the Atlantic um, or even in the Gulf of Mexico. I've had uh, um, experiences with a lot rougher waters. However, um, it does move. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small ship relative to the expanse of the ocean. And so um, highly recommended if you have, are you susceptible at all, is, is to, to see your doctor, grab some gravel or or whatever remedy. But um, I, I know we had some people who are ordinarily motion sick on our trip and uh, they, they, in their case, they uh, took some bands and had no problems at all. Perfect, great to hear. The double hull boats over always make it much more comfortable as well, which is great. A exactly. um, couple more questions here still, they keep rolling in. Uh, Eileen was asking, saying that she's a bit mobility challenged and is this tour for her? Um, yeah, I would say you're, you're, you're okay. We have some walks, particularly in, in Cape Town. Uh, and, uh, but for the most part, we're, we're, we're traveling by um, minibus uh, at, from place to place. So, you know, you, you can get by in South Africa being mobility challenged. Um, on the Seychelles as well, the only thing there uh, is, is you have to note that we have to get in and out of these tender boats to be able to go on shore. So, uh, so that's the one thing you have to keep in mind. Uh, and then you will land on a beach in soft sand and, and sometimes, you know, you'll get your feet wet landing on the beach. So to the extent that you that anyone feels comfortable getting on and off a, a smaller boat, um, I mean, there are obviously lots of crew there to assist. Uh, but you, you know, you sort of need to be able to ma manage on our own, but there's no, there's no long walks. Uh, we have, you know, the one hike, although it's not long, it's about an hour uh, when we visit uh, Tsitsikama and the garden route. Um, so, uh, but talk to us about that where I'm happy to, to speak to anybody that, you know, ha has a concern about mobility. Perfect. Uh, so a couple more questions here. Um, let me just go back, sorry. Marg was asking if we'd be able to arrange a side trip to Victoria Falls. Yeah, can do. So if you uh, if you uh, were to do just South Africa and not go to the Seychelles, then you could fly from Johannesburg up to Victoria Falls for a few nights. Um, and uh, I, yes, we can facilitate that for you. That's that's not a problem. Perfect. And a couple more, Chris had asked and Mary's somewhat asking as well if the ship's restricted to 10 cabins and you want to do both tours does that mean the South Africa land portion will also be limited to the same amount of people no uh, I mean we we will we will uh, although we're doing this as one trip together because a lot of our members were interested in both trips um, so we um, we currently have in our allotment 10 cabins for, for Seychelles, but the ship has a total of 21. So we are likely be able to get more. So I'm not really too worried about it for the Seychelles. Um, for South Africa, um, we do have a total group size limit um, of roughly 20 people because of Quandway, because we've commandeered, we've, we've commandeered, we've, we've booked the whole uh, Fish River Lodge. Um, and there are, I believe, only 10 um, lodges, like 10, 10 suites that you saw in the picture there. So the, the, we, we're aiming for a group size of around 16 to 20 people. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we, we will fit sort of in that, in that range, but we'll, we'll do our best to accommodate um, everybody. That's fantastic. The, my, I just was gonna share the private game reserve I did in the walking safari was probably one of the best highlights of my time in South Africa. Yeah, so exactly. it's definitely the way to do it for sure. That brings us to the end of our questions at the moment. So okay, if so anyone we're... has anything else, they can reach out to me um, yeah. after this. You can call a call or give me an email or, you know, we're, we love to, we love to answer questions.
um, because that's what it's all about. Uh, and uh, yeah, most of all, we'd, we'd love to have you join us on this trip. It's still a little over a year away. And I know that there's a lot of um, concern about what's happening in the world. We will get through this. Uh, it might take a few months longer, uh, but uh, I'm optimistic. I talk to colleagues all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, sometime in the, in the beginning part of next year, um, we will be back traveling again and we're all looking forward to that. So um, on that note, um, uh, we have two um, special webinars coming up the next two weeks, August 19th and 26th. We're gonna be presenting a handful of our new programs that we're gonna be releasing for 2023. I know that seems like a, an eternity away, but uh, so many of our members had said, oh, I've got trips to catch up on from last year and this year. Um, in 2022, uh, but they want to plan ahead. So if you're interested in all in what we're going to be doing in uh, in in the uh, in the years ahead, in 2023 in particular, um, we're going to be presenting a handful of those programs, and I'll mention them in our newsletter. Um, we're going to be covering South America and the Camino de Santiago and Bali and Malta and all kinds of wonderful places. So um, details, as I say, in our upcoming newsletter. Please join us for that. Thank you all so much for joining us for our Safari by Land and Sea webinar. I hope you found it informative and uh, I look forward to hearing from you and one of these days seeing all of your faces again. Uh, have yourselves a wonderful day and we'll catch up to you again very, very soon.